students and now goes until fifth grade. Um, and it varies from year to year as to whether or not we have one class or if we have a class and a half or two. Um, as Daniel was explaining, it has to do with enrollment and, and families that have selected us. Um, and pretty much our belief is that we are a pre-K through eighth grade building. And so we look to plan everything that we do in developing this one school. And so the curriculum that we design in G&T is aligned to what's being taught in the Gen Ed classes. Um, so the content is the same, but the depth um, and the pacing um, and the perspective of what's being taught will change in the G&T program. Um, but we also still encourage our kids and, you know, to go across grade levels, I mean across classes, so that when in the schoolyard you're staring at your peer, another second grader, and not, oh, that kid's GNT, that kid is not GNT. Um, so we're developing that one school idea in our building. Um, the teachers are really dedicated to trying to understand who the learner is, and that's a philosophy in the building school-wide. Um, and as you can see from the test, the test is not testing the academic ability of your child, but whether or not the logical reasoning is there, if the day is the day that you connect with that person who's testing you. Um, so we oftentimes will have a range of learners in GNT as well, um, kids who maybe just got in and therefore they're at the bottom or they're considered kind of like at grade level where gen ed, like they're gen ed peers. Um, so it's really the responsibility of the teacher to understand who that student is and, and what is it that will help them progress um, and advance and of course we also have the other range of students who maybe just missed the citywide program um, And so teachers are thinking about how to push their thinking and give them the right opportunities um, Ursula is really mindful about the work that she does with teachers in addition to doing testing She does work with our teachers in helping us design curriculum So our consultants are also aware of thinking about how we design a lesson or units to meet the needs of GNT and gen ed students um, I'm trying to think. The other thing too that we've encouraged school-wide is really giving kids the hands-on opportunity to do things, um, which is where our PTA is really su supportive in helping us have all of our enrichment programs so that kids have these wonderful opportunities that's not just limited to the academics in the classroom that supports what's going on in, in terms of the instruction. Um, can you tell us the, is there any difference in the class size? What's your um, kindergarten class size, and it, does it differ for gifted and talented? And so class size is just a very sensitive topic in our building. <laughs> um, because in the ideal world, we should not have this cap. But the cap in kindergarten is that you need to have 25 students um, in a class. Uh, this year, and as Daniel had mentioned, families have much, multiple opportunities through attrition to be placed in a program and your goal in a school is to have maximum capacity. Um, and so we currently have this year two kindergarten classrooms where we started out at you know a higher capacity of around 20, but families move, they leave the city. Um, and so right now our two kindergarten classes, one has 15, one has 16. Um, so we're in the process as we think about next year, hey, this is gonna be squished together into one class of 31 because that's how many kids make up a classroom because in about two months, Daniel's going to email me and say, fill out this survey, tell us what spaces you have available. Um, our first grade, second grade, over time, we, be, we tried to have two classes in each of those grade levels, but we couldn't sustain having two full classes, so we currently have a bridge class between first grade and second grade. We started that last year. We're doing that this year, and those classes are pretty much half and half. They're around 27, 28 kids in a class, of which half are first graders and half are second graders. Um, third grade we have one class and that's at I'm looking at the right 25 but started out the year with 29 um, and then those kids going into third grade that's the last crop of kids who take an exam to get placed after that it's yeah so it's, I can so answer. Daniel, but before you, so <coughs> this is G and T classes. This is G and T classes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So they're smaller. I'd say G and T classes in our building tend to be smaller because over the years, if kids test in, or you know, there are less op less families that are looking to push into G and T classes, the classroom gets smaller. Our fourth grade classroom has about twenty five kids in it. Our fifth grade classroom has eleven. It got to that point where we had a number of families that moved to California. Virginia, so many parts of the country that there are 11 kids 
and we cannot add any more kids to the classroom at this time until yeah. the DOE comes so. up with a fair system that's not based on testing to move kids into the classroom. So currently, my fourth grade classroom is at 32. It's at capacity. I can't accept any more 30 any more general ed kids. And my fifth grade classroom has 26 kids, and they're large. So um, can I can I ask when you say you first start off bringing one to two classes for the GT program? When do you make that decision, or do you first start off with first, and then you reach maximum number of students who ask preference for the school, and then you open it up to a second, um, or do you decide ahead of time? To have two or one classes. You kind of give the, you kind of tell, we tell enrollment, we anticipate that we can fill two spaces in our building, we anticipate we can have one space in our building, and then enrollment works with us to let us know, like, oh, well, based on the applications, we could probably fill two classes, we could probably only fill one space. And do you have an understanding for this upcoming, the 2015 year, for the kindergarten classes, whether you'll be doing one or two, or? No, I can just be. Oh, upcoming kindergarten, right. it's going to be a conversation that we have as we get closer to how many kids actually request us. Um, and, you know, we're always willing to have two, which was the case. The DOE wanted to give us one class, and we were like, well, we're willing to take two. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of, it is an ongoing conversation. So hopefully he's still in this position in, in <laughs> <laughs> Last year we didn't know each other. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah um, Good. Quick word, yes. So I guess it's a question for both Daniel and Rebecca. Um, twin specific. So I've got twin preschoolers that are testing for kindergarten. So in terms of sibling preference, would one preschooler <laughs> test to <laughs> send in? Is there a preference for the other twin? And the second question is, I know that DOE's policy is to split twins when they get to kindergarten. If there's only one GT class in our school here on the island, how does that work? So we, we do, if we're able to split apart twins, Throughout, the time, throughout their experience at school, we will split them apart. Um, in our experience where we had one twin get in and one twin didn't get in, um, then over time when the other twin made it in, they were in the same classroom. Um, so it's almost like year by year you handle it. And teachers are really sensitive to the fact that there are two siblings in there. There are two different children, two different personalities, two different abilities. Um, and it's helping you, the parent, understand which kid is which? Let's not push them because they are independent. Let's assume that they both get into GNT. If they both get into GNT, it would be just based and, on and what you we decide. If they only have one GNT class, would they then be pushed into They would end up being together, yes. And in terms of preference? So for, for admissions yeah. priorities, um, in your case, yeah. if you ch your children are in the pre-K program currently? They're here in the pre-K program. Um, and I, I, would, would you consider attending the school not in GNT next year? I, I mean, I know this sounds silly, but... Basically, you would get sibling priority to, to if one of your children or both of them were eligible, they would afford you sibling priority because they um, potentially will but be... If one scored higher, does the second one have priority? So, as a, as a twins are really interesting, so we, yeah. we actually treat the placement as if it is one child that takes up two seats, right? So, um, we, we wouldn't place one in a school without the other, necessarily. Um, does that make sense? So, yeah, but, so we reserve two seats for your kids. It's not like they have to squeeze in. But, um, but what will also happen with twins is the higher scoring twin, if both are eligible, that will determine their place on the wait list. So the higher scoring student, if if there are different scores, will kind of pull up the other one who they have to both be eligible. But um, we treat them as that one slot on the wait list. Yes, for for citywide also, yeah. So they have to both be eligible for citywide. But if one got ninety nine and one got a ninety seven, we would treat their place on the wait list as where the ninety nine fell. Um, in the event to try and place them together. Yes. Uh, so, so they're not vying for the same seats is, is sort of how I would 
think about it. So uh, you have uh, non-GMT classrooms here that afford priority to families who live in the zoned area, which is just the island, right? It, um, so they would have top priority to have admission into kindergarten. And again, we're not talking about gifted and talented. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, so... I understand, yeah. No, so... Yeah, I, I, I think I got it. So the priority is just based on your district of residence. So um, other families who live in District 2, not on Roosevelt Island, will have um, equal entitlement, essentially, to the gifted and talented spots. This school is also unique in that it also affords priority to families who live in District 30. Um, yep, yeah, so that's a, a Storia. Jackson Heights. Jackson Heights, yeah. It's a large district, but um, in part that's to try and fill seats and afford more priority to the program. So there could be seats that the school have been placed here, but another kid from uh, Queens could get that seat instead of the island seat? Potentially. And, and not just Queens, but also Manhattan. This place exists. Can you speak louder? No. No student currently enrolled in the program will be displaced. Um, they have a right to remain at the program to the terminal grade. So, um, yeah. Uh, Michael. Um, I'm Michael Hoffman. I'm <coughs> CBA. Just to be clear, I'm not in, in the citywide schools where you have a plethora of 99%, more than you can fill. Someone who has a 97 but has a sibling in one of those citywide schools has preference over somebody else who has a 99. Who does not have a sibling? Who does not have a sibling. Correct. So they can have a lower score and still get it. And then you mentioned because of this overabundance of more people have 99s than there are spots in the citywide school. You yes. said they're randomized. You said you don't want to call it a lottery. Is it picked by race? Is it picked by ethnicity? Is it picked by geography? Is it picked no. by the hat? How it's a, a random number is assigned to the applicant. Um, yes, it's, okay. it's a lot. The same way every other school does. A, no, he answered. He said yes. <laughs> a, a random number is, is and an order is <laughs> determined. <laughs> yeah. My name is Parvin. I have a three-year-old. Uh, I live here on the island. Uh, she was born in 2011. Uh, when is she going to be eligible to take the test? And do you recommend that any preparation? So your, uh, your daughter will be able to take the test a year from now, but you, can, you, you need to request for that testing in October. Um, so you'll be able to request in October, and then she'll take the test for admission in the 16-17 school year. That would be the year she's testing you into. Yes, correct. And this is where the GNT program starts to um, so there is a GNC program here, yeah, and, and yeah, in all schools, there there is no um, citywide definition. There's no DOE definition of GNT pre-K. It's just not something we um, have. <laughs> oh, the preparation. So the one thing that will come on record and recommend is the practice test in the books. Um, again, you're, there's going to be a book for your daughter's birth year next year. Um, we don't recommend other preparation in part because um, there's a risk of exposing the child to the actual test that is used, um, and that will um, essentially negate the results of the test. And I'm, again, I'm speaking about someone else's office's work now, but um, I've heard my, fo my colleagues in assessment really explain that minimal preparation is recommended so as not to... Um, have the child overthink it and be uncomfortable and anxiety. I, I don't know at the school level. Maybe you can speak to how that looks for families. And 